Okay. And hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming today uh, to the Summer Reading Brainstorm. Um, in the middle of the weirds, I liked that phrase that Jenny used um, in one of our staff meetings. Uh, and so she's just been referring to this as, as the weirds. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of everyone coming together to create this kind of brain fund for all of us to draw upon as we are all grappling with uh, what to do for summer reading. Um, so just to let you know ahead of time, this is going to be a pretty informal meeting. Um, it's just a time for all of us to share what we're feeling, uh, what we're thinking, what we're considering. Um, and also, uh, the main thing that I want to emphasize is that whatever you guys are doing at the moment is wonderful and amazing and totally fine. So please don't feel even with summer reading or whatever you're doing that you're not doing enough or that you're not being enough because I think we're all doing our best under very unusual circumstances and our best is great. So just make sure to uh, not be so hard on yourselves um, and to really celebrate the work that you are doing. Uh, and just to start off, um, to make sure that everyone kind of knows who everyone is, uh, if you could just either through your microphone or in the chat box, um, if you want to say your name, your library, and one thing that you're looking forward to in the future, um, just as a quick check-in to see how people are doing. Um, so maybe it's best to do it in, in the chat box. Um, but this is Amelia from the State Library. I guess I forgot to introduce myself. Um, and one thing I'm looking forward to is uh, making some pumpkin scones because I have leftover pumpkin in the fridge. And going for a bike ride. Brittany from Lewistown, looking forward to a 65 degree weekend. Abby from Polson, being with family. Kathleen from Bozeman, looking forward to a nice weekend. Carrie from Lewistown, woo, hot springs. Weston, being outside, bike rides. Ellie, deer, bu building a deer fence. Wow, that's, that's a project. <laughs> oh, these are great, planting gardens, swimming. Ooh, isn't it a little early for swimming? That seems kind of cold. Uh, kids, I know, homeschooling, sunshine, floating the river. Seeing patrons, having a cup of coffee. Uh, oh, Rhea, congratulations. Recently promoted to assistant librarian. That is awesome. Um, online dance class. Getting outside. A favorite dessert. Gajrella, carrot pudding. Uh, returning to the outdoors after so many days of snow. Uh, cleaning out my yard. Nice walk. Um, figuring out how to have practicum and students work for you all. Working in the garden, seeing her daughters in Missoula. Um, yeah, oh, these are so nice to hear. So um, I'm glad that you guys all have plans and things to do. Remember, self care is important. Um, and, you know, as, as Pam and Cindy had mentioned earlier, working all the time is not sustainable or viable. So it's good to take breaks. Awesome. So before we start discussing, the specifics of summer reading. Um, I actually wanted to bring up, there's been a lot of chatter on uh, state library listservs about summer reading and someone uh, shared some really, really good questions that I would love for us to discuss. And I, I put this graphic in here um, because it, I think it's important, especially in these, in the weirds, to think about why we are doing summer reading. Um, and so there's this nice graphic of the golden Mm -hmm. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So Amelia just texted me and said her internet just crashed. So we don't have her. Um, so what that that um, little golden circle on her screen was, I think we'll just keep talking and hope that she figures out how to get back on. Um, but it talks about, I think it had why, what, what was the other one? Um, that we oh. know we know and how. So we know what we do in summer reading and we often know how we do it. Sometimes we have to think about why we do it. So um, one of the things we've been talking about really as a, a country, because you know everybody that works in libraries is going through the same thing. So then there's been a lot of discussion nationwide about this is why, why we do summer reading and I think we need to think about it in terms of um, why are we doing summer reading this summer? Um, what is, has our purpose changed a little bit? And one of the things that Amelia was gonna share with you too is this screen of, um, um, it's the, you know, the basic needs, Maslow's basic needs. So, um, and sh hopefully she'll share, uh, she'll share that back with you. And, um, but that right now people are looking for safety and security and comfort. Um, and that, you know, in terms of some of the things in the past that we've done like magic shows and concerts and um, maybe our, maybe the needs of our patrons have changed. So let's, you guys, if you want to unmute yourselves, we'll have that kind of a talk because I don't want to. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't want to. Um, if it, we'll just have this talk with a, and I'm going to go ahead and do my. We can do our videos too because she's probably not taping this now. <laughs> so we could talk to each other if you want to unmute yourself and show your videos. Let's talk face to face. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ellie. Um, so one of the questions that came up at, um, was, I mean, are our patrons going to be looking for a whole lot of entertainment this summer, or are they going to be looking for something else from the library? Chime in, please. <laughs> they might just want to be, this is Pam. They might just want to, like you were suggesting, the safety and security, um, they, they might just want to be able to connect to their library again in the ba most basic ways. Um, you know, being able to sit with their librarian and read a book if possible, or, um, you know, just check out items at the, at the library and have the, have the good old programs we've always had, our story times and our babies programs and, you know, all that good stuff. If we can, if we can return to programs. If that, we can, yes. Right. But right. something even, you know, like we're trying to do um, an online babies program and we're trying to get some Amelia online, online um, story times. And so, you know, it's not easy, but, um, but people appreciate it. Even just if you try it once, um, they think, oh, yay, there's our librarian online. So. In, in Clancy and Montana City, um, we've been doing online story time. 
um, twice a week. And our patrons very much enjoy that. And they're oh, very yeah. appreciative. And then, and then we also do a craft with each story time and something that they can make with household items. Now, are you doing that story time from your home or from the library? I, I go in the library and I go in the library and we tape it there. So you're yeah. with someone else. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're not allowed to be in the library with anyone else. Oh, so we well, have to do all this stuff from home. Yeah. Well, I could do it from home too. Yeah. It's just because I, I'm the, I do the summer or I do the uh, story time. So it's just whatever I dig up. Although the books we need to get from the library. Yeah. I'm just thinking a bit more about the, um, you know, and this is just, you know, people freaking out over quality and all that stuff. Um, and so I was, that's why I was wondering if you were doing it from the library. Cause I would think, I know if we were able to do it from the library, it might be a little better yeah. Um, yeah. set up and I missed that last little bit. Amelia is going to the state library because her computer's completely crashed and she'll jump in as soon as she can get onto another computer. Oh, okay, good. So, Pam, what were you saying? What are you doing from the library or from? Well, we're, we're not. We are doing, we have an online babies program that just once a week and then we're um, doing reading stories and then putting them up. And um, Mary Catherine was saying that she, they're doing from Clancy, they're doing story times, um, but we're not allowed to be in the library um, unless we're the only one there. Um, so we can't really work with someone else. So we're trying to, you know, set it up so we can tape ourselves and, and get yeah, the book, so you know, there's just there's two of us in there at that time and we're keeping our distance, but yeah. I think our patrons just like seeing us, even if it's, and I don't think they mind that it's not very professional. Right. Um, well, and that's what I was saying, Cindy, is like, well, it doesn't really matter mm -mm. as long as they're seeing our lovely faces. Well, I, I feel like um, uh, that we're not like video uh, sensations or anything, and that's not what our talent uh -huh. is. And um, so if I took the time to try to figure all that out, then it would be a very long time. And I, you know, right. I know Ellie, a lot of librarians just jumped right in and it's like, we're just going to say hi to our people. And, um, and yeah, I, I, we're not trying to I have it very polished. Yeah. That's what I've been coaching my staff on. Um, a lot of my staff, um, actually all of our youth service team has filmed from home, including the staff that like live in a cabin in the woods in Glacier Park and don't have internet access or phone access at home. Um, we've been making it work and gotten really creative and um, I keep just t repeating to my staff um, that it's not about performance. It's not about video quality. It's not about sound quality. It's about children and parents seeing a familiar face and normal routine and um, tell, you know, telling children that we love them mm -hmm. um, and that all of our work is rooted in love for our community, which is always true. And I think that's especially apparent um, from all the homemade. Actually, I kind of like prefer the homemade videos over the ones that are kind of flashy and nicely put mm -hmm. together because it's mm -hmm. like, we're all being real homemade right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I love it. Yeah. Any other, um, any other ideas about why we're doing summer reading and, and how that might change this, uh, this, this summer? Well, Cindy, I had a question for you, uh, or just for anybody here. Um, you know, the, a recession is predicted. Um, and so I, I, I was in a meeting, and I think you were there too, a few days ago, and there was an interesting article about, um, you know, how libraries responded during 2008. Yes. Um, because they were able to gather some data from that. And I wonder, even though this, we're in a different situation, as far as not knowing if we can provide in-person or not programming, uh, I just wonder if there are any lessons that you took having personally been a children's librarian in, during 2008. Were there different, were there any differences in programming that people were wanting? I assume that, I assume that there were um, higher counts for library programs. Mm -hmm. 
but it, were, was there any kind of kind of comfort or changes in programming because of a recession other than providing more programming? I don't remember anything, Anna, and I don't know. There's a couple people I know who have been librarians for in 2008 that mm -hmm. should chime in. Um, I, I think probably what happened in 2008 is we just suffered some budget cuts and, um, but um, I don't remember, you know, maybe we had, maybe we were able to buy less books or less resources, but I don't remember. It certainly didn't affect everybody emotionally the way this uh, pandemic is. So I don't remember feeling like, you know, we needed to be the comfort and safety um, place for our, our patrons then. Um, yeah. I wonder if kind of having to provide, for those of you who are providing the remote programming, if this is something that has been really good practice for a recession time, because there's so much demand during a recession for library programming, but like Cindy just said, cuts in funding. So these, um, no matter how amateurish it may feel, um, you know, I think maybe just doing these sorts of online story times on top, if we are able to provide in person, doing these online things too, to help accommodate, you know, both the budget cuts that might come and then also increasing programming. Yeah. I anticipate I agree. And, you know, even when we are able to have programming again, we're probably not going to have 75 kids in a room. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, and, and, and when we do open up, I think there will be a lot of our patrons who are very eagerly return to the library. And I think there will be a lot of people who wait a while and don't come back into the library out of concern for their own safety, depending. Um, so I, um, I do sort of feel like our, um, our online programming will continue to be a strong resource for us. This is Susie from Great Falls Public and, and Ray has been doing a great job doing online programming, but I think one of the things that we're really thinking about in terms of the reason for summer reading is we really want to help prevent that summer slide and we really want to support those kids that um, you know, may not have those opportunities. And this pandemic is just exacerbating those differences. Yes. And, um, you know, we can provide the online stuff, but then there's those kiddos that just don't have the resources and we're floundering with that. I mean, we're yeah. looking at different, you know, incentive programs and different things, but how are we going to help those kids that fall behind? I mean, they're losing. Yeah a quarter of their school year, they're going to lose their summer. And I just, I don't have good ideas for help and support those kids. Well, and one of the questions is how do we reach those kids that don't have online access? There are kids in their homes. I mean, I think the schools gave out, um, a lot of the schools here gave out um, Chromebooks to kids that didn't have it. Um, but uh, not every kid's going to have access. And the other thing is, um, there's going to be, I think, a lot of online fatigue by the time summer comes. <laughs> I'm like, you know, one of our questions is, how many books do we actually order? And I said, I think kids and parents want to get their hands on some real books again. Um, but I'm not, um, those are the things we're looking at, too. I mean, online is good, but ugh, it, once it gets nice here in the summer, whew, I'm thinking like programs out, <laughs> outside <laughs> as often as possible. And maybe a lot of free book giveaways. I don't know. Hello, everybody. Well, I am back, if you can hopefully hear me. Hi. <laughs> I'm so sorry. My internet just pooped out. <laughs> um, so... I'm not sure where you guys are in the, in the discussion, but- um, Still doing why. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so we've been talking about um, how to reach the kids and how we're worried about the kids that aren't keeping up and um, 
the, you know, the summer slide could, for a lot of kids could have hit starting in March um, in our yes. community. Yes. And um, how we can, um, yeah, Kathleen just mentioned summer lunch programming. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really hoping that um, being able to give out lunches and then having the library be at those places, that's a good place that you can socially distance, but you can reach a lot of of kids and families that way. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to think even more so this summer in terms of how can we get out of the building because we're not gonna be able to have, you know, a hundred kids at our programs. Yeah, I mean, right now we, um, our food bank has been giving out free lunches and, and what have you um, during this whole time. And um, we're lucky enough in Missoula to get a lot of um, gifts. We get tons of gifts at our library. And so I've been boxing those up and taking them to the food bank. So they've been giving out a book um, or two or how many ever the child wants to take um, with the lunch. So at least some of the kids are getting some books in their hands, whether they are, are in a position to be online a lot or not. Mm -hmm. they're, they're at least having something, um, which is nice. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this has been mentioned already, and I'm, I am sorry again that I missed the discussion about why, but you know, under normal circumstances, you know, I think we tend to focus on encouraging that love of reading, preventing that summer slide, um, and this very multifaceted program. And, you know, just to let you all know that it's totally fine to not do that this summer and to maybe just focus on one thing. You know, there's no way, especially now, that we can be everything that we normally are to people, but we can maybe focus on on one thing that you want to do. Um, and so with this question, you know, why do you do summer reading and sort of going along with any challenges that your community is facing, maybe trying to address that with your summer reading program. And it might look a little bit different from what it normally is. Maybe it is about encouraging that family time and helping people talk about national trauma and mental health, or maybe it's focusing on self-care, or maybe it's, you know, addressing it from those, those issues. It's totally, whatever you guys are able and willing to do is great, but I, I don't want you all to feel um, any pressure from the state library side, at least, that you have to do mm -hmm. everything and be everything. And I think it's totally fine to really, really get at the heart of this question and target what you want to accomplish um, with your summer reading program. That's a good point, Amelia. And I think also, um, maybe this isn't the summer to count as many kids as possible. <laughs> yeah, who cares know? about statistics? <laughs> like, I well, mean, no, what it's about it's about equity, not, a, not equality, right? So if, if if you have a limit, if we have a limited number of times, I mean, I think, I hate to say the word should, but I think we can think about um, really being, okay, those kids who are latchkey kids and their parents are not home and they don't have resources and they have one magazine and a phone book in their house and that's it. I mean, those are our kids that we can think about focusing on and those kids who you know, went to a Montessori preschool and have two middle-class folks, they don't need us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we can think in our own communities about where people are. Well, we know people are at the grocery stores, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and we know people are at laundromats. And you know, we have to think about the, the resources that are open in our communities. And maybe that's where just a friendly librarian is at the doorway greeting people and saying, hi, can I give your kids a free book? Yeah. In my gloves and mask? <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple other things that have come up in the chat. Um, so Mary Susie from North Dakota, welcome Mary. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Uh, on the Arsenal Town Hall, they talked about doing story walks instead of story times. Uh, Kathleen mentioned the summer lunch program and including free books with lunches. Um, partnering with school, Ellie from Kalispell mentioned we're working with local agencies to get high quality stuff, Duplos and books and art supplies to kids with food insecurity and kids served by the health department home visitors. So yeah, that's a great point. Certain organizations already know 
who is facing these challenges and can quickly identify, yes, these people need these sorts of things. Um, Kathleen mentioned uh, school libraries will be open again for us to do programming there outside in collaboration with school librarians. Weston said this pandemic really exposes the need for our services and the lack of resources for a lot of families. What we can provide materially and emotionally is what is difficult to me. Um, Ellie talks again about um, trauma-informed library services, which I think definitely is going to become more of uh, a talking point. Um, and then Kathleen mentioned making mental health okay to discuss in public with kiddos, uh, emotional intelligence. Mary says to keep the stats, just lower the expectation for what those stats will be. And yes, I, I will still be collecting stats, but I, I don't want you all to feel any sort of pressure about if, if that's something that you're you're not able to prioritize, that is totally okay. Um, and then Lori, I think from Dylan, is saying we're getting more calls recently. The community is really struggling with being homebound and looking for more library resources. I'm worried if the students don't go back to school, what will happen with our resources? We are going to be bombarded with students and adults trying to reconnect. And then Susie says transportation is also a big barrier. Our public transportation has been closed for weeks. So these are all really, really great points. Um, and I think, go oh, sorry, go on, Cindy. Well, I was just going to say, um, I had a, a couple points too. One is um, when Kathleen was talking about school libraries, we're not sure if the schools will be open or not, but regardless, um, it's really important that we reach out to our schools and let them know um, when we know um, what will be going on at the library this summer. And um, because they're in constant contact, the teachers and the principals with their students even online. So, mm -hmm. I, and it's not one time, but I think we, you know, I'm sort of thinking we start in May and we, you know, go meet with our superintendent or our, um, at, at our, at the principals online, give them a call and see what we can do because we've talked about the library being a little bit of a bridge. If we think about the library being a bridge this summer between schools been out, but hopefully it's going to reopen and, mm -hmm how can the library help the schools and the students connect mm -hmm. to next fall? Yeah. Um, the other um, thing I wanted to talk about was the idea of the story walk. I love that idea. Somewhere in Colorado, somebody's doing them. And at the end of the story walk, they just have a librarian there with make and take crafts. So you've put together them in your you know little, you know, gloves and sanitizer and you put a little bag together and when the kids are done with the book, then a friendly librarian is standing there, you know, with a craft for them to take home. And then, you know, if you're counting, if they're counting books read, that counts as a book read. That's awesome. That's a really great idea. That just again, so the story walk, are the children gathering somewhere? No, a story walk is you take, you have to buy two copies of a book and you um, laminate each page of the book and you put it on either a metal or a wooden spike. And we're gonna do it at our, our library and you just put it around the library and they walk socially distanced and they read the book as they are walking along. And I'm thinking, this summer might be good to actually find a way to do it so that you can change out the book like every two weeks. Um, and that's one way that you can have kids reading and then you have a little thing at the end of it, um, you know, maybe during lunch hour or something like that. You, I mean, you can't have a staff person standing there the whole time, but or during your regular story time, instead of having a regular story time, you do a story walk and that's when you hand out the make and take bag of something that has to do with the story. Yeah. Um, a couple other comments in the chat box. Lori says, we've gotten messages that people are looking forward to the summer reading program. So they're not canceling anything yet, but if everything reopens, will there be restrictions on how many can attend and how do we choose who can attend? So that's a really good thing to start thinking about. Um, and, you know, remaining in contact with your 
local health department and local government because those are the regulations that you will have to follow. Um, so again, uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, but at our COVID meetup next week, we will be discussing reopening plans. And we're hoping to do some research to try and find um, examples of plans from other libraries across the country, and we'll hopefully have some examples. Uh, but feel free to bring in any questions that uh, we can all discuss together and maybe workshop into plan A, B, C, D to Z. <laughs> um, Lori says, we did a story walk throughout town and let people and people let us put the storyboards in their lawns to make it longer and more community participation. That's great. <laughs> Kathleen added a story walk image if anyone wants to look. Um, and then Ellie says, all materials we're working with are quarantined for a number of days, three days between anyone handling them. Kits assembled, wait three days. Kits given in a low contact, no contact way. The CDC has good guidance as does our local health department. Um, so yeah, so make sure to prepare enough time. Yeah. Um, and I guess we've already been talking about this question, but um, along the lines of, you know, for some libraries, especially, you know, Lori's uh, community that are reaching out saying, oh, we're so excited for summer reading. Maybe the best thing for them is to have the summer reading program as they've done um, as, as best they're able uh, to, to have that sense of continuity and sort of like, oh yeah, this is something that's continued even in these weird times. Um, but maybe if your community really is facing something that you want to focus on with your summer reading program and that becomes the why of your summer reading program this year. Um, if you want to share some ideas, chances are if your community is struggling with something, other communities are also struggling with something. And it also doesn't have to be a struggle. Uh, similar to um, Lori saying how the story walk was extended uh, around town. Maybe there's a really great asset that you can take advantage of um, for your summer reading program and, and focus on that and sort of bring that and highlight that. Um, Sherry from North Dakota. Oh, welcome, Sherry. If doing kits, maybe have the kids pre-sign up, especially if you need a three-day wait period. So that's a really good idea. Um, but in terms of challenges, I know Lori's mentioned the social isol isolation is definitely starting to get to people. And I think that is global. <laughs> Everyone is sort of starting to struggle with that. Um, but feel free to put other things into the chat box or unmute yourself if you'd like to, to share or brainstorm anything. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is um, the unknown. We don't know. We don't yeah. know what our libraries are going to look like this summer, um, and um, when when we're going to be able to do anything. So I think we're all sort of looking at a combination of like when we can actually see people face to face, and mm -hmm. how much more online stuff we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to just I. Um... I hate living in that that like unknown limbo period. I find that personally psychologically exhausting. <laughs> I think a lot of people feel the same way. And um, you know, with the guidance from obviously, you know, people with medical expertise, um, just sharing our, my decision making process, um, we decided to go with Beanstack, and which we like. If you've seen Imagine If Summer stuff, like it, there has been no counting of books no counting of pages read. It's all hands-on. So the whole idea of Beanstack is like very different from our model that we've done in the past. And oh yeah, sorry, I'm Ellie from Imagine If. Um, so we uh, basically, I looked at our timeline and looked at where we were in April. Actually, I was doing this at the end of March, but I was thinking, you know, where are we in the year? Do we want to have stuff right for when school gets out and kids lose that sense of structure that their school is providing them right now remotely? And the answer was yes. So we actually sped up our decision making process and made the decision to go with Beanstack. And right now we are planning as if our libraries are still closed. We can have no physical contact with kids. 
Um, we can't even do kits. We're basically like worst case scenario is what we're planning for, um, the most conservative option. And that has been liberating <laughs> um, both professionally and psychologically because it's like, okay, now I'm no longer wringing my hands. I'm like, okay, this is what we're doing. It's the most conservative option. Now we can move forward. And I won't be asking my team to change horses mid-race uh, you know, in May or June or any time later that we're just, we picked a decision that was conservative and we think is safe and we're moving with it. And then of course, you know, if later we're able to add something very small, like add kits or add, you know, free book drop-offs or picnic in the park story times, we'll do so. Um, but it, we just made a decision and just bit the bullet. And that has been amazing for me. That's a really good idea. And I think it also, even if you're starting with like the most conservative plan A, I think moving from everything online, no kits, no whatever, and then being like, oh, we can add this and add this at that mm -hmm. is a lot easier of a direction to go in compared to the other way. So yeah. that might be a really good idea for people who are sort of similarly like what do we do <laughs> there's there, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future um so again if we go to everything online then we have to figure out how do we find those families that don't have an online presence so mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we are always thinking about you know like right now we have our stuff on facebook well Think about how many people don't have a, aren't on Facebook. And um, so we have to be always trying to figure out how we still reach people in our community. And maybe it means, so we're, you know, in the grocery store and we have a little table and we're signing kids up online, you know, even if they don't have a computer to do it, we can still sign them up online to have an account and, and at some, you know, we can just make, are you know the bookmobile with weston could maybe you know be doing that too it drives around and lets people do their checking on a computer yeah. so um a couple other comments mary said that uh grand forks public library in north dakota is doing a completely online summer reading program no options for in person um uh, commiserations about how limbo is the worst. <laughs> and then North Dakota is also doing a statewide virtual summer reading program kickoff week, June 1st through the 5th. Um, they're really excited about that. They're going to use Facebook, so we know they won't get everyone, but they feel it's the best option at this time. Weston said, bookmobiles, community stops, and safe ways can assist with non-internet families. Um, and then Ellie said that there's going to be an all paper option for kids without tech access as well. Um, Something else that I, I think I saw somewhere, or maybe it was a fever dream, who knows, uh, but people communicating through mail um, and like sending, like purchasing stamps and sending stamps out along mm. with like paper logs and having people mail stuff back in. So mm. maybe that could be an option. Um, also the postal service could use some love right now. <laughs> um, so Another idea would be to um, contact your newspaper and work in collaboration with them and see if you can print out a log and summer reading information mm -hmm. in your newspaper or any other any other printed materials that end up in people's mails. I don't yeah. know if that's, you know, the utility bills or, or um, yeah, maybe even with uh, voting stuff or elections. Um, I don't know if that might be too much to, to organize, but there is a lot of stuff that comes in through the mail and maybe different companies and organizations might be willing to help with stuffing those mailers. Um, I had another thought and I just forgot it. So I guess it wasn't important. Um, Ellie says my mantra right now, don't let perfect get in the way of doing something, which is a really good attitude. A good one Laura for said, all times. <laughs> yes, yes. Laura said, how fun would it be for kids to write letters to essential workers to let them know how much they appreciate them? That would be a really great um, program. Uh, you could coordinate it through the library and then disperse them out uh, so that 
people's personal addresses aren't being shared. The Lewis and Clark Library also had a really cool program with sending mail to seniors. Um, there's a link about that in our COVID guide. So if you want to find out more, you can look at that. Uh, but sending things to retirement centers, community homes, um, senior centers, that sort of thing. And then Mary did say that some utility bills come in electronically, so that might not be an option. Um, radio is another thing too, in terms of getting the word out. Uh, contact your local public radio station, and a lot of times they do PSAs for, for free. Um, and then Kathleen said, my kiddo is starting a pen pal activity with classmates via snail mail. So mm. that's kind of fun. And your, um, our local PBS station, I think we could work with them as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the Collaborative Summer Library Program does have PSAs. So I will put that on my list of things to do to send the PSAs out to um, mm -hmm. TV stations. Yeah. Um, and we've been talking about this question as well, but what does success in summer reading look like for your library? And especially as we're all pivoting uh, in the weirds to meet the needs of our communities, you know, again, it might help here to focus on one thing and be like, this is the one outcome I would really love. Um, maybe it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, people, mm -hmm. people, Get, getting back in touch with snail mail, or maybe it's um, making sure that all the kids from the home visiting list are having access to a book. Um, having actually, I think, really specific goals in this instance might be super helpful in helping you structure your program. Um, and you know the normal the normal benchmarks that we normally have i think it's totally okay to try and keep those but also to institute new ones um that address some of the the whys that we've discussed in in the first question so i think this is another important question to keep in mind as we're planning um success might look really different this year and that's totally fine um so a uh, question from Jody: Has anyone considered asking Curtis, a Lego guy, or your magician to provide a recorded program that could be shared with the community? Yeah, I don't know what anyone's done with performers so far. Uh, Kathleen also mentions collaborating with local PBS stations to create TV programming with librarians for those who don't have internet service. I can get the local PBS TV station without any kind of service. And later on, Jody, in regards to your question, not specifically with Curtis, but uh, a couple other state library folks um, from Ohio, I believe, are compiling a list of virtual performers that they're going to share out with people. So once I have that, I will um, send that to you all. And they're currently confirming with various performers about who is willing to do a virtual program. So that will probably be forthcoming sometime. <laughs> uh, and I'll send that out once I, once I do get that. And then Emily from Stevensville said, any ideas for older kids, tweens, and teens? Um, wow, Lori said, hiking, paintball activities, cook-off, and a murder mystery dinner. That's super cool. Lori, if you want to share the details of that, feel free to. <laughs> um, there was another idea um, about, uh, for those libraries that give out prizes, that is probably not a good idea that we're handling prizes and giving them out that you could do something where you read for cause and we go to our local businesses that need us, like a local restaurant or our local co-op or whatever, and ask them for little uh, gift cards or something and that kids read for gift cards mm -hmm. and um, they read for a cause. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then we would give out a, a little gift card to the local bookstore, or the local children's store, toy store, mm -hmm. restaurant. I like the idea of reading for a cause rather than reading for a prize. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, ben, we do, sorry, oh, sorry. On. We So with our hiking, because we have so many hiking trails around here um, and kids can stay away from each other, they don't have to hike right next to each other, mm -hmm. that we hike up to the M we have an M on our mountain and a B on our mountain. So we can hike over to those and back. And the paintball um, 
have a friend that has a lot of paintball equipment and so we also figured that with the equipment they already have the helmets on and stuff and we can clean those and you don't want to be within six feet of each other getting hit by a paintball so the teens are really really excited about that one um we always do a cook-off and people donate use of their barbecues so we have a bunch of barbecues lined up and the kids have certain items that they have to use and then we have judges and the kids have to cook and then the judges judge the food and stuff and then it's a big potluck so everybody brings different items that they can share in the and we have a dj that usually comes and plays music and then our murder mystery dinner it's all teen led and they get together and they write a script on what they want their characters to be and they create this murder mystery and the people that come and watch it we do it in the park and then the people that come and watch it have to try to figure out who murdered whom and so it's set up in different three different stages of skit that's awesome thanks. yeah thanks and it's really good and the we're getting more and more teens involved in this we've only been doing a teen program for maybe three years but it's really expanded and we still get people questioning us about the cook-off when's your cook-off when can we come we want to participate in that mm -hmm. so and we have a local chef that comes and helps with it that's great um yeah and then you had a question from weston uh can i get a copy of the murder mystery program um so if you're willing to share that uh lori that would be great everyone loves a little imaginary murder <laughs> yeah last year was our first one and i don't mind sharing it i do have it um, it is a Disney characters. So I can send pictures as well because the pictures are hilarious. And we had um, some a local hairdresser help us with the makeup and get the the characters created. Ooh. And it's it's so funny and they're hilarious. But we did we had like Timon and Pumbaa and um, Mother Gothel. And so, so that cool. one was a Disney one. This year we're doing a Renaissance one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, even just as Cindy said, doing things that you've done in the past and then just figuring out how to make it CDC safe and adhere to, to the newer regulations, um, something to keep in mind. Um, and Carly mentioned that there is a great summer reading group on Facebook. Just search for Imagine Your Story SRP 2020. Um, so feel free to look at that. Uh, okay, so we don't have too much time left. I'm sorry, I thought there would be more time for just general discussion. Um, but a few things that, you know, I think is really important to keep in mind. Again, it's okay to do something completely different for summer reading this year and don't put extra pressure on yourself. Um, I think Again, we all need to be kind to ourselves in terms of the work that we're doing and the things that we're, the challenges that we're rising to meet. And I think all the work we've done is incredible and amazing. Um, so don't feel like you have to do things exactly the same or, you know, that you have to, to rise to something because we're already rising to what this is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just don't want you all to put any extra pressure on yourselves. Again, don't worry if registration numbers or stats are down this year. Um, that is totally fine. And it's not an accurate reflection of the work that you're doing and the strength of your community. So don't tie any value to those numbers, especially for this year, because there's so much that's been happening. Um, and don't worry if you can't keep track of stats registration numbers. Again, I'll be asking, but I don't want you to feel guilty if you're not able to provide those because I know that you're providing other more important things for your patrons. Um, and again, do what you can and take care of yourselves and take pride in your work. Um, and then Cindy says, one suggestion I heard was that if your staff has already put effort into planning, just make some changes and no need to start all over. That is totally right. <laughs> Amelia, um, I was thinking it might be helpful to do this again. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking maybe that too. You no, know, maybe we know a few more things or maybe, you know, everybody's gotten really good at the online reading programs or mm -hmm. whatever. Like, it, I think it would be helpful to kind of continue this 
uh, idea generating um, sharing forum um, mm -hmm. so that um, yeah because I think we it's good to have each other's support and um, we know that you know if Lori's doing something great in Dylan or Ellie's doing something great in Kalispell like we've got people then we can say okay I mm -hmm. need some help with this yeah so I would love to do another one in May if we could yeah if, if that is good with other people where I'm more than happy to do another one if there's interest. Um, and real quick, Lori put her email in the chat box. So if you all would like to contact her, feel free to do so. Um, cool. Then yes, we'll go ahead and get another one scheduled um, for May so that we all have another chance to talk. Things may have changed. By then. <laughs> Things may have changed by then. So we'll see. Um, so a couple summer reading resources that have come through listers and things. Uh, one thing is um, the State Library is actually looking into Beanstack and Read Squared right now. And, you know, similar to uh, imagine if, if you guys are in a different timeline and for planning purposes, feel free to make moves. Um, as your library best sees fit. Uh, like, I don't want you all to feel in any way hindered by our process. And because it's the state library and state government, it does take a little bit longer to do. Um, but we are looking at both products. So if you are interested in exploring summer reading online, uh, please do let me know. Um, and it's totally fine if you're still interested now and you weren't able to make the initial uh, cutoff for interest. That was just so I could send something to the companies to get a quote estimate. But they've actually given me a quote estimate for various different scenarios for 20 libraries, 30 libraries, and then if the entire state uh, were to sign on. Um, so if you are interested, please actually email me and let me know and I will add you to my list and that will help us make a more informed decision about it. But some things to take into consideration. Um, for Beanstack and Read Squared, there is quite a big cost difference. Um, Read Squared for one year, this is for 20 libraries, uh, was about $6,000 for a subscription. And then Beanstack was, I believe, um, eight, mm, maybe it was 15,000. Uh, so there's there's quite a big difference in, in um, subscription prices. Um, there has been, I'll just sort of summarize my notes, um, that Beanstack does have a nicer looking interface, I believe. Um, they have a much sleeker looking app, I believe, and um, that's been something that people have commented on. Um, for both programs, I think there is a little bit of time investment needed. For any online summer reading program, there's time investment that's needed to set things up. So figuring out how to set things up for your patrons, then also figuring out how to administer the program, run your stats, get all your challenges and games and um, recommendations and things in there. Uh, so that's something that you should take into consideration when you're thinking about if you want to email me to be put on this list, um, because it's not just like a boop install. Uh, you, you do have to go through training and we're also talking with both companies to see what that training process looks like. Um, but it's it's going to be involved. Um, and I believe for Beanstack, it is a lot more involved, it sounds like. Um, so that's another thing to, to keep in mind. Um, and also just thinking about whether or not you want to use it beyond summer 2020. I think for a lot of us, this is sort of a forced experiment. Um, so something that we maybe wouldn't be interested in, we're now interested in. Uh, but, you know, that's something to consider whether this is something you only want to use for this summer or if it's something you are interested in using later on. Um, so let's see, a few questions in the chat. Yes, Jody, feel free to uh, email me if you'd like to be included in my list. Um, Abby asked, is that per library a total for 20? Uh, the, the numbers I gave is total for 20. It's not $15,000 per library, oh my gosh. Um, 
And then Laura says, Beanstack is slick, but so pricey. Yes. Um, and then you can also use either program for other reading programs, like One Book, One Bozeman, Winter Reading. Both of them have a thousand books before kindergarten. I believe both of them have the Big Read as well. And you can pretty much customize and create whatever program you want. Uh, both of them have, That's that's been a piece of, of um, feedback for both of them. They're like, they're very customizable. And so you can make it what your library wants it to be. Um, and with both of these, you all would have your own website and your own portal for patrons to access. And you can customize that with your own images and your own challenges and all of that sort of thing. Um, and Ellie mentioned uh, they're splitting it with our adult programming budget, but I know that our library has a lot of financial privilege. Um, and for the finances side, I am not sure what the state library is thinking of doing, whether we're hoping to cover everything or if it will be a mixture of state library funds and then contributions from individual libraries. Um, so I think that's still under discussion. Um, but I am hoping that I'm guessing that you all would like something by June 1st so that you can do your summer reading program online. Um, earlier. Earlier, yeah. So that's another thing with Beanstack, I think because they've seen a lot of um, interest, uh, they're not necessarily able to guarantee a start date of June 1st, it might, it might be later. Um, I think under normal circumstances, they say 40 days for implementation. And, and now I think it's sort of dependent on their resources. Um, and Read Squared though, I think they said that they can get people up and running uh, within two weeks. Um, so that's another thing to consider. And then I have two resources here. So there's a virtual performers uh, survey that uh, a librarian in Ohio is compiling. So I will send this out to you all. Um, so if you want to contribute somebody like Curtis Mork, the Lego guy, uh, and you've confirmed with them that they are okay with online uh, virtual performances, please feel free to contribute that to this survey and that will be shared with us later on. And then there is a virtual programming database in California. So I was gonna ask California if I could just have access to the spreadsheet to share that out, but I was also wondering if this might be of interest to replicate in Montana or if we just wanna use California's based on what they've already collected. So the link here is to the survey monkey that they've used to get programming ideas from librarians. Um, so if, if you're interested in this, let me know and I can, I can ask California if we can have access <laughs> and I can share that with you. Uh, a couple other comments. Mary in North Dakota looked at both Beanstack and Read Squared as well. Um, Ray said Beanstack wanted a decision by April 15th and that ended up not being feasible for us. And from the State Library, that was not feasible for us either. Uh, and then Cindy said, I love the idea of supporting any of our local performers. Um, so, yes. And then Sherry says, Liz Gibbons Camp Adult Services in Ohio. Yes, she's the one who is compiling the national list of performers. Um, so if you do have anyone to contribute, please feel free to do that. Uh, but this, the, that information will be shared uh, later on too. And so now at 1.02 p.m., this was the time for general discussion and any questions, comments, and ideas. Uh, I am more than happy to stay online for anyone who wants to discuss further. We will schedule another meetup in May so that we can continue this conversation. But if anyone needs to head out, feel free to, um, and uh, you can join us at another time. Um, but thank you all so much for your, your thoughts and, and contributions and ideas and all the hard work that you're doing. Um, it's great to just hear what other people are considering and thinking about, so. And yeah, I'm so glad the people from North Dakota were able to, to join us. So Mary and Sherry, thank you for coming. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording for now.